Good evening, ghoulies and ghosties and long-leggedy beasties. This is Alex, coming at you from the underworld, and welcome back to another episode of... This weekend, I'm finally reviewing a book that I should have reviewed last summer. However, as many of you know, I've been in this weird zone where I simply can't get my shit together. And if you saw the video I uploaded last weekend, you understand why this review is so late. But anywho, this weekend, I'm reviewing the cosmic horror story The Fisherman by John Langan, which this awesome book had been recommended to me by the kick-ass viewer known as Bryce Kirkham. And on that note, I would like to add that I buddy read this with my good friend Tammy and my good online friend Hanny which I really enjoyed that experience because we each had completely different views in regards to what we read. Like, one of us preferred the more contemporary aspects of the novel, whereas another person preferred the historic origins. Then there was myself, who just simply enjoyed the book as a whole. And because of how diverse our preferences were here, it makes me wonder how a larger group might react to Buddy reading this book together. So, anywho, with that said, I would just like to thank Tammy and Hanny for Buddy reading this with me, and I would like to thank Bryce for recommending this book because it was very entertaining, it was very original, and it scared the ever-loving living hell out of me. So if any of you are watching this review, I hope you enjoy it. Also, as a side note, just to make everyone jelly, when I decided to get the print version of this book, I went to Amazon and for some reason they did not have the print version available at that time. So as I was trying to hunt this down, I went to the publisher's website and discovered that I could purchase a signed edition, which of course, you know me, I had to do that because that's how I roll. Like, yeah. Check that out. Too flippin' sweet. This is never gonna leave my library. For people that want to read this, you have options. I'm not loaning it out. This baby is mine. With bragging rights aside, it's time for me to stop my ranting and get down to the nitty gritty. So, without further ado, let's join Abe and Dan as they head off into the Catskill Mountains to fish at the infamous landmark known as Dutchman's Creek. The Fisherman by John Langan is told in a non-linear format and is divided into three parts known as Men Without Women, Der Fisherman, A Tale of Terror, and On the Shores of the Black Ocean. Now, the first part, which takes up about a good 25% of the book, introduces a character named Abe, who explains that a decade prior, he had befriended a co-worker named Dan, and they had bonded over fishing to cope with the fact that their loved ones had recently died. Well, as their outings continue, one day Dan suggests to Abe that they try visiting a lesser-known spot called Dutchman's Creek which, after Abe agrees, they head out to try new waters. However, before they get to their destination, they gain a disturbing history about Dutchman's Creek that's been passed down by word of mouth throughout the years. From here, we receive a backstory that takes up about a good 50% of the novel, and it's revealed that 90 years prior to Dutchman's Creek and the reservoir existing, the area was inhabited by a community that was known as the Esopus River Valley. In this telling, a timeline is presented that details the presence of a mysterious black-clad stranger in a creepy old mansion known as the Dort House. And as the years pass, it's documented how the residents of this community are terrorized by things that no human should ever encounter. Also, it's revealed that their experiences are but small glimpses into a cosmic nightmare world that has the potential to flood into our reality. Then, as the third part of this story unfolds, the focus returns to Abe and Dan, and eventually, they learn the hard way that sometimes 
Some places are left alone for a reason. The Fisherman by John Langan was published in 2016 by Word Horde, which is an independent press that specializes in horror fiction. After publication, The Fisherman won the Bram Stoker Award for Superior Achievement in a Novel. It was also praised by Paul Tremblay, who described it as illustrious, frightening, and deeply moving. Laird Barron said, it is what you get when a river runs through it goes straight to hell. In an interview conducted by Fantasy Lit by Marion Dietz, it was revealed that The Fisherman took Langan 12 years to write and complete. Langan added that the biggest development occurred in the middle section of the book, where he decided to follow his more extravagant narrative impulses. With the setting of The Fisherman, Langan elaborated that he was born a little south of the Catskills, across the Hudson in Dutchess County. And having been raised in that area, the Hudson had not only a profound influence on his life, but his work. Yet it was due to Langan reading Stephen King and William Faulkner when he realized your particular location could serve as your fictional setting. Langan also explained that with The Fisherman, he needed Lottie's story for the exterior narrative to achieve its full significance. And although he felt like he was taking a risk by presenting an interior story that was so outrageous compared to an exterior story that was more contained, he liked the way it reflected something of our daily experience by how our experience is intersected by narratives of history, religion, and culture. Fun facts! Here's a few things you might not know about John Langan. John Langan is the author of two novels, which include The Fisherman and House of Windows. And he is the author of five short story collections, which include Sephira and the Other Betrayals, The Wide Carnivorous Sky and Other Monstrous Geographies, Mr. Gaunt and Other Uneasy Encounters, Children of the Fang and Other Genealogies, and Corpse Mouth and Other Autobiographies. Langan is one of the founders of the Shirley Jackson Awards, where he served as a juror during its first three years. He currently reviews horror and dark fantasy for Locus Magazine. Langan received his Master's of Arts degree from State University of New York and his Master's of Philosophy from the Graduate Center of the City University of New York. He was also an instructor at State University of New York where he taught creative writing and gothic fiction from 2000 through 2018. Now that we have that covered, it's time to move on to the spoiler segment, which, if you haven't read this book before, I'm about to reveal some things that could ruin the experience for you. So, if you would like to click away, just scroll down to the comments, and you'll notice that I have a pinned comment at the top with a timestamp in it. Once you click that timestamp, it will direct you away from the spoilers and move you to the thoughts section. Now, you only have 17 seconds to do this. So, ready, set, go! Since everyone's had the opportunity to click away, I would like to talk about a few of my favorite moments. First up is the scene where Helen tries to invade Regina's home. Now, leading up to this, locals had dubbed Cornelius Dort and his guest as boogeymen because of the unexplained things that surrounded them. And aside from them gaining this reputation, as the years pass, it's revealed that the valley where everyone resides is to be turned into a reservoir. And it's during this time where Cornelius passes away and his guest, who still looks just as young as he did the day that he moved there, inherits the Dort Mansion, where he continues to run his strange experiments with a nearby spring. Shortly thereafter, new families relocate to the valley for work, 
and once everybody becomes settled, a woman named Helen commits suicide by allowing a mule to run over her because she believed her husband George had been cheating. In turn, this caused George to sink into a deep depression where he had the stranger at the Dort house resurrect his dead wife. From here, a married couple named Idolo and Regina take in George and Helen's children because the children are now too afraid to be around their mother who has returned to them. Which, this brings us to the fateful day when Helen shambles up the road to Idolo and Regina's house to retrieve her children. However, Regina sees her coming in advance, and after she tells all of the children to take refuge in their bedroom, she confronts Helen at the door and refuses to let her inside. Even still, Helen is damn determined to get in this house, but before she can cross the threshold, Regina slams the door shut on her arm. Now, although Regina and the children she's trying to protect are able to get the door shut, this doesn't stop Helen from coming back another night to try again. And even though with this second attempt, Helen is able to get her hand inside the house where she can grab a child, Idolo and Regina beat the hell out of her arm, which to everybody's surprise turns into a flipper. So the moments where Helen was trying to enter Idolo and Regina's home truly scared the ever-loving living hell out of me. And I don't know if it's because of its pacing, its description, the idea of children being in danger, or all of the above, but personally, whenever something happens in a story where a creature or a person is lurking around the outside of someone's home trying to get in, that is my immediate go-to where I get the hell up, lock the door, and pull the curtains. And aside from this just being absolutely terrifying with the idea of home invasion, the author truly hit a home run by how he described Helen's appearance. Like, for example, she has these really gross golden eyes, her skin is wet and clammy, she has this disjointed movement when she walks, and this is what really just got under my skin, but her voice is described as sounding like what would happen if an eel or a lizard tried to speak. My second favorite moment was Lottie's experience in the Black Ocean. Now, leading up to this, after Helen had tried to invade Idolo and Regina's home, she approached Lottie, who had been collecting almonds for the bakery. And it was during this interaction that Helen spoke to her in a dead tongue, which caused her to enter a comatose state. While incoherent, Lottie wakes up in the black ocean, where monstrous sea life is swimming around and beneath her. Also, adding to these horrors, in the abyss that she's trapped in, she is surrounded by nothing but thousands of pale white people who she believes are dead. Then, as she's taking everything in, she's confronted with a girl who looks identical to herself, where this alternative version is speaking to her about wanting to have sex with Idolo and how she hates her younger siblings and wants to kill them. Meanwhile, as Lottie is receiving all of these negative visions, she feels something gigantic rise up from below. And when she looks down, she sees this huge cavernous maw of a monstrous snake opening up and swallowing hundreds of people all at once. Then, to make matters worse, as she tries to swim away, she discovers that she can't escape. Until I read this book, I never came to terms with the fact that I have thalassophobia. I mean, the opening scene in Jaws did scare the piss out of me, and it kept me out of murky and dark water for the entirety of my existence. However, Lottie's experience in the Black Ocean really took the cake for me. Like, even though the monstrous sea life and the pale white people were pretty damn creepy, it was the Leviathan that was swimming under Lottie that really struck a nerve with me because throughout my life I've had a reoccurring nightmare that was identical to Lottie's experience. 
And until I read this book, I had never encountered a movie or book that had detailed one of my nightmares in such fine description. So, yeah, obviously, I'm not the only one who's scared of this crap. My final favorite moment was the grand finale. Now, leading up to this, despite the bad reputation of Dutchman's Creek, Abe and Dan continue forward with their outing. However, shortly after they arrive, Abe catches this hideous-looking nymph on his line, and Dan uses this opportunity to explain the reason why they're here is because he had read his grandfather's journal, and upon doing so, he had gained the understanding that if they visited the creek, he could potentially see his family again. Then, after Dan leaves to pursue the fisherman, Abe encounters what appears to be Marie, who seduces him and leads him to the black ocean. And once he's on the beach, he sees that Dan has been reunited with his family, who does appear to be human. But at the same time, they have these monstrous qualities that prevent them from looking 100% human. Which, it's at this point that it's explained these beings are actually reflections of people who had once lived. Meanwhile, as the fisherman and his humanoid-looking helpers are trying to reel in the leviathan that they caught on the shore, Dan makes it clear that he plans to stay with his family to help give strength to the fisherman. And even though Abe explains he plans to return to our world, Dan tries to restrain him in case the fisherman also needs his strength. Yet, after Dan receives an injury due to their struggle, his family becomes attracted to his blood where they come over and eat him. In turn, this allows Abe the opportunity to escape back into our world where he concocts a believable lie to tell the police. Then, after all of this is behind him, even though he's given up fishing, he's constantly plagued by nightmares. From here, years pass, and it's revealed that Abe's neighborhood has the potential to get hit with a 100-year flood. And even though the majority of his neighbors decide to evacuate, he remains behind to keep an eye on things. Which, of course, the flood hits and he gets isolated. But in this time, the reflection of Dan comes to visit him, where it's explained that this storm has widened the crack between our worlds. Then, after Dan refuses to leave, Abe sets him on fire and chases him outside. Which, this is when Abe notices there are horrible things that's floating around in the water. And upon realizing the amount of danger he's in, he turns right back around and locks himself inside his home. Come the next day, Abe is rescued by a police boat. And as they are getting ready to leave the area behind, Abe notices that in the distance, there's rows and rows of the same humanoid, pale white people that had been on the shores of the Black Ocean. And among them is the reflection of Marie. However, she's not alone, because at her side, she has two children who share her same nose and sharp teeth. Which, this tells me these are the children that he and her had produced when she had seduced him in the woods. Y'all, even though the ending was very simplistic, it haunted me for days to come. First off, I had no idea that Abe's little neck of the woods that seemed like this quaint little quiet place had the potential to crack open and bleed another world into our own, which could easily be here permanently. And I think the main reason why this freaked me out so badly is it brings into perspective how something can lay dormant or out of sight, out of mind for a very long time before it just explodes and creates a huge catastrophic disaster. Also, I consider how the horrors of this book stretch from the 1800s to current time. And even though the story isn't told in a linear format, I do feel like I gained a detailed historic timeline that shows how the past has the potential to affect our current life. Which, this makes me wonder, what in our reality has been biding its time for the right moment to strike?
I would like to take this opportunity to bitch. Now, I know Cornelius Dort got his shit together and won the hearts of many people before he died, but back in the day, he had the charisma that was equivalent to a damned anal wart. Like, first off, he would beat the ever-loving living hell out of anybody if he thought they had wronged him, which, as you can imagine, this little bastard had a short fuse, so you could just look at him the wrong way and it would warrant a beating. Secondly, little Peckerwood here ran people off of their own property so he could gain that land. Third of all, Beatrice married his crusty old ass simply for the fact that if she did that, her father would be spared of his fuckery. Also, old dipshit here went as far as to killing the horse that accidentally wrecked Beatrice's carriage. I mean, my god, dude, it was an accident. It was a horse. You didn't have to send Clip Clop off to the glue factory just for that. Now that we have all of his assholeism out of the way, I will admit I am glad that he became a better person in his golden years. But this makes me question, even though he decided to become this grandfatherly figure before he was ready to knock on heaven's door, did this really excuse all of the bullshit he had done in the past? Because, y'all, I'm just gonna be real with this. Some shit, it is irreparable. The Fisherman by John Langan is a cosmic folk horror story that's ideal to read during the warmer months. And while it presents some pretty iconic characters, it presents some hard-hitting themes as well. Like, it focuses on grief, obsession, toxic masculinity, and inner darkness. Aside from that, I noticed where this book had some pretty cool foreshadowing and it stood as a moral cautionary tale. Character-wise, I was really invested in Abe and Dan as well as Lottie and her family. Now, even though Abe and Dan began as the main characters, I don't mind that the book shifted its main focus over to Lottie. Which, I say this because I feel like Abe and Dan had already been well-established enough and anything more could have been overkill. Plus, I tend to think had it not been for Lottie's history, the experiences that Abe and Dan had wouldn't have been half as impactful. So, for that reason, I feel like their story and her story complemented one another very well, and I felt like it was a good balance. But, although I felt invested in the characters that were presented in the past and the present, Tammy noted to me that she was more interested in Abe and Dan's story, whereas Hanny said she was more interested in Lottie's story. So, as you can see, due to how this book is constructed, you might enjoy the past more than the present, or vice versa. Or you could be like me and just simply be invested in the book as a whole. Theme-wise, the main focus of The Fisherman regards grief, which this is primarily seen through the experiences of the male characters after they had either lost their spouse or their family to death. And, in my opinion, despite all of the struggle he went through, I think that Abe was the only character who had successfully reached acceptance, as he was pretty adamant in the fact that once a person is dead, they cannot physically return to you. Yet, opposing him, the other men in this book, such as Dan, George, Cornelius, and the Fisherman, all remain in denial. And because of them being so determined to regain what they lost, they go to extreme measures, which results in disaster. So if we compare Abe to these other men, we see that even though the grieving process can be painful, it is necessary. And if you don't properly grieve, there's a good chance that you might do some irrational things. Also, even though I've never lost a spouse or child to death, because of how Langan presented Abe and Dan's mental state, I really felt privileged to not be in their shoes. Which, because of the emotions they suffered, it also brings into perspective that you should not take your loved ones for granted. And as I read, the fisherman truly struck a nerve with me because it made me question what I would do if I lost my husband. 
And as I contemplated that question, I would have to admit the answer totally sucked. Another subject this book focuses on is obsession, which this is primarily seen with characters like Dan, George, Cornelius, and the Fisherman. Now, every time I meet characters of their mindset, I'm always reminded of Dr. Frankenstein and how obsessed he was with giving his creation life and how that obsession ended up destroying him and the people he loved. Which, very much like that classic, the same tone is in this book. Anywho, to give some examples of this topic, we have the fisherman who has dedicated his life to catching the thing in the black ocean, and this is so he can gain its power. Now, I wish I could elaborate a little bit further on that, but if I did, I would reveal some spoilers, so I need to move on. But aside from him, we do have a scene where Dan is ready to settle for a manipulation of his family simply because that manipulation can fulfill his emotional needs, even though he knows that this manipulation really isn't his family at all. So because of this, it really speaks volumes of what these men are willing to do despite the consequences. And there are a few different other ways where obsession comes up in the book, but these were the ones that I found to be the most interesting. Another subject that comes into play is toxic masculinity. And while this aspect of the book doesn't beat its reader over the head, it is a subject that is seen here and there throughout. And the thing is, a lot of times when the phrase toxic masculinity comes into play, people think it's limited to physical or mental abuse or misogyny inflicted by a man. However, there are times where the phrase is suitable for moments that aren't as extreme, such as people believing that they shouldn't cry because they believe crying is a form of weakness. Now, with that in mind, toxic masculinity in The Fisherman is rather obvious when it comes down to characters like Cornelius Dort, but it's also shown when Abe mentions that it feels weird for him to hang out with Dan if they aren't fishing. So, for this reason, when fishing season's over, the men really don't do anything much together because Abe feels awkward about it. And while it doesn't specify if Abe feels this way because of Dan's personality or not, I can't help but wonder if Abe is worried about how others might perceive their relationship as being intimate if they don't have a masculine hobby to share. Aside from that, another way this is seen is by how fishing has granted Abe and Dan the opportunity to bond over a similar grief. But instead of taking advantage of that circumstance, neither man really confides in one another to share their emotions. And for the most part, both men just really stay to themselves. That is, until the end when Abe tries to be the voice of reason for Dan. But even still, it didn't feel like a flow of feeling. I mean, it felt like he did what was necessary to try to save his friend by trying to convince him, but at the same time, it just didn't have a flow of feeling that came from that character. Which, I don't think this is an accident on the author's behalf. I think he actually did a pretty good job of showing how hard it is for some men to truly show their emotions. Another subject I noticed was inner darkness, and I felt like this was best explored with Lottie's character, especially when she was confronted by a manipulation of herself in the Black Ocean which it was during this time that the manipulation spoke openly to her about wanting to murder her siblings and to have sex with older men. Throughout the book, I really saw Lottie as being an innocent character, but when this scene came about, it did cause me to question a couple of things. Like, on one hand, I wondered if Lottie actually had these dark desires that were buried deep within her subconscious, and her manipulation was trying to encourage and expose those. But, on the other hand, if she truly was an innocent, then was her manipulation trying to corrupt her? Regardless, I really do feel like this scene shows that no matter how good of a person you are, we all have an inner darkness to us. It's just that some people are a little bit more extreme than others. 
With themes aside, I would like to note that I really admired how the fisherman opened up paying homage to Moby Dick. Which, to be honest, I've never read Moby Dick before, but Hanny had pointed out that the opening line of Moby Dick is the protagonist saying, Call me Ishmael. And with that in mind, the fisherman opens up with the protagonist saying, Don't call me Abraham. So I found that to be kind of humorous, and I just really thought it was cool that we got a nod to a classic with the opening line. So yeah, that was fun. Also, in the first part of this book, I noticed a little foreshadowing, which this came about when Abe was admiring pictures of Marie, and three images in particular were focused on the most. Now, by the way he has these pictures laid out, it really reminded me of the tarot card spread that's intended to show the past, present, and future. For example, out of the three photos that are mentioned, the one that's located to the far left of the lineup shows Marie having fun under the sun. Then the image that's in the middle shows Marie standing in a creek with sunlight coming into her right and shadows coming into her left. And the final image shows Marie before she passed away where except for a little bit of sunlight coming in from a window, she's surrounded by darkness. And I really thought this was brilliantly done. I really love how the author presented this visual timeline through photos of how she was so full of life and then to have that robbed from her in such a small amount of time. So that really struck me. Other than these three photos showing a visual timeline of Marie going from light to dark in her physical journey, I feel like the last image hinted at foreshadowing for Abe, where it suggested he would meet Marie again, but it would be in a dark place. In The Fisherman, Abe's character asks if a story can haunt you or possess you. To which I say, yes it can, because this story haunted me long after my read, and aside from it scaring the ever-loving living hell out of me, it creeped me out, and there were a couple of scenes where it did gross me out. The Fisherman by John Langan was a book that I entered blindly, and I was blown away with the result. Also, even though this work is very original with its visuals and concept, I kept thinking it felt like what would happen if Stephen King's Pet Cemetery took place at sea. And if that wasn't enough to hook me, I really enjoyed the alchemy nods and the Lovecraftian aspects while we were set against the backdrop of the Hudson Valley. But anywho, at the end of the day, if you're looking for a cosmic horror story that has the potential to scare the hell out of you and would also be an ideal read for summer, then I do highly recommend The Fisherman by John Langan. Well, now that we're at the end of this episode, I would like to thank these amazing people for contributing to my Patreon account. As you can tell, some of the contributors listed here are creators, so be sure to check out their work. And if you would like to contribute to my Patreon account, just go to the description section of this episode and you'll see that I have a link available, which for $5 a month, I'll give you a shout out at the end of my videos like what you see here. And if there's a certain profession you would like for me to tie to your name, just let me know and I'll include that. Also, I do have a second tier for $10 a month, which not only will this give you the shout out that you see, but I do creepy photography on the side, so at the beginning of every month, I'll send you over one of my creepy photos. From there, you can print it out and do whatever you like. So if you're able to do this, that's awesome. If not, no sweat. I just hope you return to this channel so we can have a good time together. Also, if you would like to hit me up on social media, links to my Facebook, Twitter, TikTok, and Instagram are all available in the description section of this episode. And if you haven't subscribed to this channel, be sure to subscribe because I have more book reviews coming in the near future. So until we see each other again, I hope you have a great week and sweet nightmares.